scholar, so I will be speaking in terms of the legal system largely. Uh, I am, I want to be clear, I have sued corporate polluters, I've lobbied elected officials, I've run for political office myself, I've been arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience. Yes. I have, thank you, I'm always in the right crowd when that's the, when it's the reaction. <laughs> I have used every tool available that I can find to try to create the ecologically sustainable, socially just system that we so richly deserve but so clearly lack in this country, and have come to the conclusion that this, our current legal and political institutions and systems do not provide remedies for the abuses that the four witnesses have given us. They simply do not apply. And to that end, I'm going to take a step back and make a distinction between the law, or what the law is, and the concept of jurisprudence, what the law should be. The United States Constitution is the supreme law of the land. It is a property rights document. It is not a human rights document. Never mind the rights of nature, which is not even contemplated within that document. So the concept of nature which is to say what we depend upon for life itself and what we are part of, is literally not part of our current legal framework whatsoever. Uh, and we must look to other countries and societies, uh, which we have heard in the very introductory comments, Ecuador, Bolivia, which are at the cutting edge of, and I will say, rediscovering. Because it's really important for us to recognize that indigenous peoples, who were connected to the land, and by the way, all of us, myself and you, no matter what your ethnicity is, come from indigenous peoples. Let's just remember that, that that's a very important thing, that that's actually our collective birthright. But every human society that came out of an indigenous perspective had something called original instructions. That is to say, how to conduct ourselves on this planet in a way that is sustainable and that we will not only have a rich and vibrant and productive life for ourselves, but most of them and many of them talked about generations. And some of you may have been, heard of the seventh generation. And I engage, dare you to engage this thought experiment with me. Seven generations. I'm generation one. My children is generation two. My children's children are generation three. The fourth is their children. The fifth is their children. Are you still able to even do that? I can't. And you know why? Because I'm part of a society and culture that has not taught me to think that way. It's not that I'm defective, it's that this society is defective. It is the culture and the society in which I have been born is not properly recognizing my role as a human actor in this larger ecological web of life. And so the original instructions of indigenous people were their fundamental law, their supreme law, and you know what? Their supreme law had solutions for every one of these problems. Actually, correction, none of these problems would have happened. Right? The reality is that we are dealing with a fundamental law in this country that is actually facilitating this abuse and harm. Under the Constitution, we have to recognize that the Constitution limits the power of government. I could talk to you about corporate constitutional rights how corporations have the 14th Amendment right that says no state shall deprive any person of equal protection of the law, and how corporations are actually using that doctrine in order to overturn health, safety, and environmental protection laws. I could talk to you about the con contract clause of the Constitution that says no state shall pass any law impairing the ability or obligation of contracts. I could talk to you about the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution, which says, quote, private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation. I can talk to you about regulatory capture, which is the concept in which water, any uh, uh, permitting or regulatory agency which is designed to actually facilitate a just and equitable system actually gets captured by the industries that they purport to regulate, and most certainly that has happened in California, because I want to conclude with this. The past water diversion that has caused all of the problems that we're experiencing now is totally legal under the current system. 
Yes, there are a few doctrines that might be able to provide us some remedies. And as Mr. Tuttle said, I completely agree. We use every tool that we have available, but we cannot kid ourselves. The reality is that the current system does not provide a remedy. And likewise, the pumps and the tunnels that proposed under the current legal framework is also legal. So at the end of the day, we are going to have to come to terms with the fact that we have to use every tool available to us. I say, one, look at those communities who are passing local laws, regardless of whether they are allowed under law or not, and let's do more of that. Engage in municipal civil disobedience, where we use the political and legal system to actually assert our rights to create a just and equitable society. Two, we have to look at the larger scope and the United States Constitution and recognize we are going to have to abolish this idea that corporations have constitutional rights. We are going to have to restructure the idea of the Commerce and the Contracts Clause. And at the end of the day, we have to engage in politics and economics in a new way. The solidarity economy that is growing and emerging cannot be merely a niche place. It has to become what we do. And our legal system, our political system, and our economic system have to reflect that. I'm going to conclude with these things. On the horizon, we see the Richmond Progressive Alliance, where we are seeing, yeah, right on, we are seeing the Richmond Progressive Alliance as an example of the local community doing it. Cooperation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi. I'm from the South, y'all. This is the culture, right, you can applaud the Cooperation Jackson, the heart of the old cultural a uh, confederacy elected a black nationalist to actually be mayor of that city and began to take the city in a different direction. We can look at Kashana Sawant in Seattle, an openly socialist who got elected against the, uh, the desire of the ruling class and the Democratic <coughs> Party leadership. And lastly, we can look at the energy and the excitement that the Sanders for President campaign is beginning to emerge across Woo! this country. And my challenge is this. If we're going to have a political revolution, it cannot be one candidate. It cannot be one election cycle. We're going to have to dig in. And as the, as the civil rights movement said, every one of us, me, you, the person in your seat, we got to figure out to get in where we fit in. Peace.